afternoon. We're here today to discuss another great hero, a true hero, uh, Cesar Chavez. So, so far we've been discussing what's been leading up uh, to our discussion today is Henry David Thoreau's civil disobedience. Uh, we discussed uh, Thoreau's uh, policy of nonviolent resistance, passive resistance. And so he was a great inspiration for Reverend Martin Luther King. Uh, Dr. King was greatly inspired by Thoreau's works, echoed some of the same themes uh, as, as civil disobedience. Uh, and so now uh, we're setting Cesar Chavez. And uh, Ch Mr. Chavez had said, in fact, that Dr. King was like a, a role model for him. He really looked up to him. He was like a mentor. And uh, in his uh, memoirs, uh, Mr. Chavez wrote that even though he didn't have the pleasure of meeting Reverend King, he did speak with him several times on the phone. And so uh, greatly inspired by Dr. King's words and actions. So um, you'll see in the module I have, uh, this module uh, I've typed out um, all those speeches uh, are, are me typing everything out for you all so that um, everything is in one place. It was kind of challenging to find uh, several of uh, Mr. Chavez's speeches or, you know, correspondence, writings. So uh, anyhow, it should make it uh, far easier for you all for the online discussion, for the discussion board, you know, just to cut and paste uh, from those quotes. Um, Cesar Chavez is seen as a folk hero. Uh, I feel like I see him not just as a leader, but as a preacher many times. When you read his speeches, sometimes it sounds like sermons, uh, which is really neat. And um, you, you get an even balance of sorrow and yet hope and optimism uh, in his speeches. So there's a sort of uh, equilibrium uh, very noble individual. He also preached nonviolence uh, in an industry that uh, used violence, unfortunately, on these migrant laborers whenever they wanted to unionize. So uh, really great, great man, extraordinary activism on his part. Mr. Chavez was the founder of the UFWA, uh, and that stands for United Farm Workers of America. So he started this organization, and I believe in less than 10 years, there was something like 80,000 members. Uh, so he, he, he started the Farm Workers Union in 1962 specifically. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the climate uh, of tension during this time period. Uh, talk about shameful eras uh, in our history. So uh, there's uh, racial hostility towards Latinos in California in the 1940s. And believe it or not, theaters, for example, were segregated. There would be a white section, quote unquote, white section, and then a section for, quote unquote, those of Mexican descent. And so uh, I love this defiant act of Cesar Chavez. I think he was a teenager, maybe 17, 18 years old. Uh, when he went to the movie theater, he refused to sit in the section that was uh, designated for those of Mexican descent. Uh, and so uh, he had to, uh, you know, uh, he refused to take a seat uh, there in the theater. And um, unfortunately, he was uh, sent to jail. That was for a short period of time, but that was the first time uh, he went to prison. So, uh, but again, uh, as a teenager, that defiance, the fact that he challenged segregation, isn't that admirable? Uh, that's quite impressive. Uh, let's talk a little bit uh, before, I'm just going to read a few uh, excerpts uh, of his great speeches, uh, just a few here and there. Uh, some of them are in the modules that you have, uh, some of them aren't, but Let's talk a little bit for a second about the physical conditions uh, that, uh, you know, were happening at this time. And this is why he wanted Mr. Chavez to uh, unionize the farm workers, understandably. So migrant workers, the climates, the conditions that they had to work in were just were horrendous. They had to work 15 hour shifts uh, under the merciless sun. This isn't just adults, it's children as well, uh, unfortunately. Um, you know, the payment uh, to the workers was slow. There were absolutely no other uh, benefits uh, available for them. Housing was sparse. 
really they just had to get up and leave uh, from season to season. Uh, it's very fluid uh, sort of uh, existence uh, for them. They had to move seasonally from one state to another. Their employers treated them so harshly you know, with such a degrading attitude. Uh, I remember reading some of his correspondence. Uh, Mr. Chavez said uh, he didn't have fond memories of when he was uh, a little boy because I think he had to be uprooted 30 times at least and he had to go to different schools. Um, and, uh, you know, the teachers were very mean to him, uh, you know, in these schools. And so that's, that's such a shame, uh, unfortunately. But uh, anyhow, so you get the idea here. His uh, parents... Uh, were migrant workers as well. And um, actually, uh, Cesar Chavez was born uh, here in this country in Arizona, uh, where his grandfather uh, had a ranch. Uh, they had a farm ranch, uh, I think in the 1880s, as far back as the 1880s. But then unfortunately, the state uh, took possession of that ranch uh, and that land when um, Cesar was just a little boy. So anyhow, uh, so anyhow, uh, talking about the migrant uh, workers, uh, life for them meant no stable, secure home, uh, no secure job, no guarantee of food after a long day's work uh, on the farms, believe it or not. They weren't allowed to partake of the food that they were picking. I mean, that, that's just... Uh, you know, unimaginable, that's unacceptable. So anyhow, uh, Mr. Chavez decided to organize workers to, to resist these oppressive labor conditions, um, but to do so in nonviolent ways. He was activating a pacifist attitude, much like Dr. King. Uh, in fact, Dr. King would send uh, Chavez uh, telegrams uh, in support of him and his work, even though uh, Mr. Chavez's crusade was specific in terms of labor relations. So uh, several influences uh, on Cesar Chavez. Of course, one of them was Dr. King. Uh, another great influence was Mahatma Gandhi, uh, that his philosophy of nonviolence appealed to Chavez. I wish there was enough time this semester to, for us to study the works of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Also, uh, Chavez was influenced uh, by the minister uh, of his church's congregation, Father McDonnell. And Father McDonnell, uh, you know, it was he who has to be credited with introducing uh, Chavez to uh, the works of St. Francis, for example. St. Francis preached humility and also the works of Gandhi. So uh, anyhow, um, so with regard to uh, this amazing activism uh, of Cesar Chavez's, he uh, started uh, this uh, grape boycott uh, for those who worked, uh, you know, on these uh, grape farms. Uh, he wanted to bring dignity and justice uh, for these workers, for these migrant workers uh, in the farm community. And so he was representing not just citizens of Mexican descent, but other Spanish speaking groups, those of Puerto Rican descent, those of Filipino descent. Uh, and so he orchestrated these uh, huge marches. Um, one of them, I think, was 340 miles. It was a 340-mile trek uh, from Delano to the capital in Sacramento. That was in the mid-1960s. Uh, and so he just wanted to uh, bring this cause, this very worthwhile cause, to the attention of others with these huge marches that he uh, organized. So. You know, what's really fascinating about Chavez is he was ahead of his time in terms of the enviro environmental movement in this country uh, because he was bringing to light, uh, you know, all the harmful effects of the pesticides, the harmful effects on uh, the farm workers, on the consumers, and on the environment, on the natural environment. So I feel like Mr. Chavez was laying the foundation for what we now see today uh, as uh, this uh, great environmental movement. Um, anyhow, so uh, so much uh, that Mr. Chavez endured in terms of fasting. Uh, you know, he wanted uh, to show uh, he wanted to show the personal sacrifice that he was making, uh, of course, in a very peaceful manner. And so, um, I understand. You know, uh, of course, Dr. King he gave up his life. 
uh, for his cause. He was just tragically, horrifically assassinated. And really, in a way, I've always felt that Mr. Chavez also sacrificed his life uh, in a different way. All the fasting that he had to endure again and again for years, it took a toll on him physically, and he died. He was only in his mid-60s, 65, 66, when he passed away because, uh, you know, there's different accounts, for example, of all the effects on him physically, uh, very debilitating. I think after one fast of 30 days, uh, he couldn't even drink water. Uh, after a certain point, he was unable to drink water. As a result, he, he had high uric acid, and so he had to be hospitalized uh, immediately. He ended up having issues with his heart, uh, erratic heart, uh, heart trouble. Uh, I mean, just a whole host of uh, problems. I remember reading one account from a doctor who had visited him uh, when he was in prison, uh, you know, as a protest, uh, he, he was in prison. And so uh, the doctor had noted that his nails, uh, Mr. Chavez's nails were just as thin as tissue paper because he lacked protein. He lacked any kind of diet uh, when he would fast, you know, for a month or more. So yes, he sacrificed his life uh, you know, uh, physically as well as, of course, emotionally for this uh, worthwhile for this worthwhile cause. And so, uh, let's take a look here. Just a couple, uh, you know, quick uh, excerpts uh, I'm going to read. So this is from the module. This is uh, that I typed out uh, for his writings. This is the Good Friday letter. And so uh, this is a letter that's. Uh, Mr. Chavez addressed to the head of uh, a growers organization. I think the head of the growers organization was the California Grape and Tree Fruit League. Uh, so the president of this league had falsely accused uh, Chavez and his group of violence uh, on the part of Chavez's strikers. That's not true. We know that's not true. That's a false accusation. Look at what Chavez wrote. Just as, this is a part towards the end of that letter, Good Friday letter. He says, um, let me be painfully honest with you. You must understand these things. We advocate militant nonviolence as our means for social revolution and to achieve justice for our people. But we are not blind or deaf to the desperate and moody winds uh, of human frustration, impatience, and rage that blow among us. Gandhi himself admitted that if his only choices were cowardice or violence, he would choose violence. Men are not angels, and the time and tides wait for no man. Precisely because of these powerful human emotions, we have tried to involve masses of people in their own struggle. Participation and self-determination remain the best experience of freedom. And free men instinctively prefer democratic change and even protect the rights uh, guaranteed to seek it. Only in the enslaved in despair have need of violent overthrow. So eloquent. Uh, and so he goes on, this letter does not express all that is in my heart, but it, if it says nothing else, it says that we do not hate you or rejoice to see your industry destroyed. We hate the agribusiness system that seeks to keep us enslaved and we shall overcome and change it, not by retaliation or bloodshed, but by a determined nonviolent struggle carried on by those masses of farm workers who intend to be free and human. Uh, my gosh, he is just the voice of wisdom, isn't he? Uh, here's another quick excerpt. This is uh, from it's from my module, Jesus's Friendship. Uh, take a look. Such a spiritual gentleman uh, he was, Mr. Chavez. Uh, so this is from uh, Jesus's Friendship. Jesus's life and words are a challenge at the same time that they are good news. They are a challenge to those of us who are poor and oppressed. By his life, he is calling us to give ourselves to others, to sacrifice for those who suffer, to share our lives with our brothers and sisters who are also oppressed. He is calling us to hunger and thirst after justice in the same way that we hunger and thirst after food and water. That is by putting our yearning into practice. It is not good enough to know why we are oppressed and by whom. We must join the struggle for what is right and just. Jesus does not promise that it will be an easy way to live life, and his own life certainly points uh, in a hard direction. But he does promise that we will be, quote-unquote, satisfied, parentheses, not stuffed, but satisfied. 
end parentheses. He promises that by giving life, we will find life, full, meaningful life as God meant it to be. Uh, very eloquent. Uh, and uh, look at how he ends this letter. Uh, uh, sorry, this writing, Jesus is friendship. This is the last paragraph. He puts into practice what it means to sacrifice for others. His words are powerful because his life is an example of what it means to hunger and thirst for righteousness. He challenges us to be different than we are. He leads us away from death and in the direction of life, and he promises us that we will discover the blessings of God if we join him in his work among the poor, the sick, the lonely, the powerless powerful words. Uh, take a look at this other one. Uh, this is uh, an excerpt from, and it's in the module, to be a man is to suffer for others. Quote, unquote, our struggle is not easy. Those who oppose our cause are rich and powerful, and they have many allies in high places. We are poor. Our allies are few, but we have something the rich do not own. We have our own bodies and spirits and the justice of our cause as our weapons. When we are really honest with ourselves, we must admit that our lives are all that really belong to us. So it is how we use our lives that determine what kind of men we are. It is my belief that only by giving our lives do we find life. I'm convinced that the truest act of courage, the strongest act of manliness, is to sacrifice ourselves for others in a totally nonviolent struggle for justice. To be a man is to suffer for others. God help us to be men. Such nobility, my goodness, such grace. Uh, and so also, this is from uh, another module. I have Martin Luther King Jr. Part 1. Uh, and I use this quote on the syllabus, you'll notice. Uh, take a look, take a look here. Uh, he says, um, if for every violent act committed against us, we respond uh, with nonviolence, we attract people's support. We can gather the support of millions who have a conscience and would rather see a nonviolent resolution to problems. We are convinced that when people are faced with a direct appeal from the poor struggling nonviolently nonviolently against great odds, they will react positively. The American people uh, and people everywhere still yearn for justice. It is to that yearning that we appeal. So uh, he also has several uh, quotes here and there. Uh, this isn't uh, necessarily uh, in any of my modules, uh, but take a look. Uh, for example, quote unquote, love is the most important ingredient in nonviolent work. Uh, that's a great quote. Here's another one. There is no such thing as a defeat in nonviolence. Uh, how about this one? Uh, quote unquote, nonviolence means people in action. It's not discussion. It's not for the timid or the weak. Nonviolence is hard work. It's the willingness to sacrifice. It's the patience to win. Actually, uh, Dr. King uh, had, uh, this is one of the telegrams, one of several that he had written uh, to Mr. Chavez. Uh, take a look here, very inspiring mentor. Uh, so this is a telegram from Martin Luther King uh, to, to Cesar Chavez. As brothers in the fight for equality, I extend the hand of fellowship and goodwill and wish uh, continuing success to you and your members. The fight for equality must be fought on many fronts. In the urban slums, in the sweatshops of the factories and fields, our separate struggles are really one, a struggle for freedom, for dignity, and for humanity. You and your valiant fellow workers have demonstrated your commitment to righting grievous wrongs forced upon exploited people. We are together with you in spirit and in determination that our dreams for a better tomorrow will be realized. You know, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's widow uh, visited uh, Mr. Chavez uh, when he was in prison and uh, in his uh, memoirs, uh, Chavez recounts when she visited him, uh, he could tell that she had had that experience before of when, when she would have to, you know, visit her husband, uh, for instance. And so, uh, anyhow, my goodness, these great historical figures. Um, this is uh, another great quote. This isn't in my module, but uh, this is another great quote of Cesar Chavez. The greatest tragedy is not to live and die as we all must. The greatest tragedy is for a person to live and die without knowing the satisfaction of giving life.
for others. He's just a great man who sacrificed a great deal, uh, isn't he? My goodness. Uh, he sacrificed a great deal. And so uh, let's, let's take a look here. This is just one more quote. Uh, this is about the act of fasting. Uh, for him, a great physical sacrifice, quote unquote. The fast is a very personal spiritual thing, and it's not done out of recklessness. It's not done out of a desire to destroy myself, but it's done out of a deep conviction that we can communicate to people, either those who are for us or against us faster and more effectively spiritually than we can in any other way. So uh, anyhow, uh, all sacrificing, uh, great leader, uh, and really, again, as I see him as not just a folk hero, but uh, as, as a preacher. So um, he, uh, he, his birthday, uh, I'm sure you'll note, uh, in March, I always make sure whatever class I have, uh, you know, we just uh, make sure we pay tribute uh, to Mr. Chavez in some way, you know, fondly remember him, uh, his sacrifices, and all the greatness that came out of uh, his movement uh, for uh, social justice. And uh, also, uh, of course, there's schools, libraries, parks that are named uh, after him as an honor to him uh, as well. So anyhow, um, I, I believe he, he did speak at Harvard, uh, Harvard University. He spoke at the Democratic National Committee, uh, the one for uh, then uh, Democratic nominee Jimmy Carter. Uh, so yes, really wonderful, powerful speaker. And I really appreciate Cesar Chavez's speeches for their accessible, down-to-earth style uh, and tone, uh, and also his strong convictions. I feel like he was not just an effective uh, speaker, but writer uh, of speeches uh, as well. So anyhow, uh, I hope you all enjoy, uh, you know, his speeches, his writings uh, in this module. And I just, I cannot wait until I hear your comments, uh, you know, for the discussion board, uh, you know, for this, uh, for this segment here. So uh, anyhow, uh, take care and happy reading.